Okay, so let's um, look a little bit more at the uh, these perceptions here. That was the death perception. Now we come to the perception of the repulsiveness of food. Uh, when that is developed and cultivated, it is very fruitful and beneficial. It culminates in the freedom of death and ends with the freedom from death. That is what I said, but why did I say it? When a mendicant often meditates with the mind reinforced with the perception of repulsiveness of food, the mind draws back from the craving for tastes. That's what I said, and this is why I said it. So, um, this is another one of these contemplations that I would not necessarily recommend all that much. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, it's, <laughs> if, yeah, if, if, if you are, I mean, again, if you, are, if you have something else to live on, like the joy of the mind, yeah? if you can live on the joy of the mind, of course, then this is easy to do. You can do it because you can reject all of these other things. And in fact, the suttas talk about uh, the devatas, and the devatas are often said in the suttas to be piti bhakka. And piti bhakka means that they are the devour piti, yeah, the devour joy. Yeah. So you actually live on joy, you sustain yourself on joy. Yeah. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Uh, and of course, if you sustain yourself on joy, then of course, you don't need to crave for taste because you have something far superior. Yeah. So again, it depends on where your meditation is and what you're doing for these kind of things. Yeah. Uh, but generally speaking, I would not recommend this in ordinary life because you're just too busy and you need to enjoy the simple things in life. Yeah, like uh, uh, nice food. Yeah, this is important. Yeah, it's, it's cof nice coffee is important. Yeah. Uh, but there is also a way in which this particular perception can be understood in a different way as well because the Pali here is the Ahara Patikula Sanya. Yeah, Patikula means repulsiveness. But the word ahara is an interesting word because, uh, yes, it can mean food in some contexts, uh, but it can also mean there are four so-called nutriments yeah, for existence, uh, uh, or false sustenances uh, for life. Uh, and only one of them is ordinary food, like solid food. Uh, but there are three others, uh, and this is kind of uh, makes, kind of broadens out the scope for these things. Uh, and these other things are, the four aharas in Buddhism are, Ordinary coarse food, uh, contact, uh, yeah, in other words, just experiencing the world, uh, uh, volition, the will, uh, and the last one is consciousness. Uh. Did I get that right? I think I got that right, uh, yeah. So these are the four aharas, uh, yeah, the four kind of things, and these are aharas in the broader sense, uh, and they give you sustenance, uh, yeah, uh, they are foods for you in the broader sense uh, that these are what gives life meaning. Uh. Yeah, if you can do these things, then you have a meaning in life. That is what then makes you want to live on. It sustains your life as a consequence. And so this can also be seen in that way, in a sense. Yeah, seeing the repulsiveness of all of these aharas, like uh, contact, for example, experiencing the world. Uh, there are some very powerful symbols for that in the suttas. Uh, how that is just irritating, uh, because the mind can never be peaceful. All you have is this constant irritation uh, you know, why do we close our eyes in meditation, for example? That's an interesting point. Because, and the reason, of course, why you do that is because sight or seeing is irritating. It takes up a lot of mental space. It is very disturbing because it is so much going on. They say of the five senses, sight is about 80% or something. It's a very dominating sight, a very dominating sense. So if you close your eyes, yeah, you can... Uh, Meditate better because you have less distraction. Huh? There's still enough distraction in the mind, yeah? even after you close your eyes. Huh? And if you want to listen to something carefully or concentrate, you close your eyes, right? Huh? You really want to concentrate, you close your eyes. Why? Because it reduces the distraction. Huh? And so this is in a way you can start to understand why sensory contact is a kind of a, almost like an irritation of the mind. Huh? So you withdraw the mind for that. Huh? And you see a kind of repulsiveness in these kind of foods, these kind of purposes for existence. The same thing with the will, yeah, the volition, we talked about that before, how the will and the doing can be the same thing, yeah? and how a peaceful mind is far superior to the mind that does, the mind that always thinks, always is in, in motion. Peaceful mind is far more happy. 
Yeah, again, you, after a while, you even grow a kind of, a, you grow the perception of repulsion also in that context. And then you have the consciousness itself. Now that's where it gets really tricky because that's when it becomes very profound. But ultimately, the idea there is that all experience ultimately is a problem. All experience is somehow irritating and problematic. And so you withdraw from everything. But that is the broader kind of way of thinking about this. But the main thing here, obviously, is about food, because that's why it says craving for tastes. Otherwise, you wouldn't have tastes there. So that must be the main idea. So what actually is the word for taste here? That's a very good question. Actually, it's not that good a question. It's a reasonably good question. Huh? Not super good question. Huh? Um, where are we? Repulsiveness of food. Uh, craving for tastes. Uh, rasa tanna. Yes, that's exactly. Rasa is tastes. Rasa. Okay, so let's let's not stack too much time with the repulsiveness. I think it's a bit marginal. I don't think many are any of you here interested in repulsiveness of food. No one. Okay, no. One. Okay, so let's let's go on to the next one. <laughs> let's move on. Then it's easy. Yeah. So just eat bad food. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> Very hard for hard for anyone, I think. <laughs> okay, let's go on to the next one. So these are things that we have done before. We don't need to spend too much time on it. So I'm going to go a bit, uh, maybe a little bit faster. When the perception of dissatisfaction with the whole world is developed and cultivated, uh, it's fruitful and beneficial. It culminates in the freedom from death and ends with the freedom from death. That is what I said. But why did I say it? Uh, when a mendicant often meditates with a mind reinforced with the perception of this this dissatisfaction with the whole world, their mind draws back from the world's shiny things. That's what I said, and this is why I said it. This is uh, the uh, loka chitra, ch shiny things are like, like the, all the uh, variegated things in the world, yeah? all the variety in the world. Uh, yeah, it's like when you like to travel. Yeah, it's the people here, you like to travel? Huh? You enjoy traveling around there? Huh? Yeah, why do we... <laughs> Why do we enjoy traveling? Yeah, because of the world's shiny things. Yeah, because the world is full of shiny things. We want to see the Eiffel Tower. We want to see the, uh, what else do we want to see? We want to see the, the Great Wall of China. We want to see all of these kind of things. We travel to all the capitals and the big cities. We want to see all the palaces in Europe. We want to get, go to Vienna, to Paris, to, to Rome and see the Colosseum. I don't know what there is. And we want to go to Japan and see all the ancient temples. And I have been around quite a bit myself. So I know lot about what's actually out there yeah. and uh, but what is interesting yeah is that um, the more developed your mind becomes the less interesting these things actually are yeah. because you realize it's actually just more seeing it's more hearing yeah. it's more tasting yeah. it's a small variations on the same thing yeah, yeah. it is nothing all that interesting after a while yeah. and uh, so you ask someone like i remember and i, I love this little thing is yeah i said uh, and Brahm was giving this talk to the monks, and he said, yeah, you all want to go and see the wall, great wall of China, but just go up to the monastery wall and check out the monastery wall. That's good enough. <laughs> and the, the Bod Bodhinyana monastery wall is like this dinky little wall that's kind of completely uninteresting, yeah? But for Ajahn Brahm, that's plenty good enough. Well, wall is a wall, yeah? That's kind of <laughs> end of story. That's a typical Ajahn Brahm, right? And... Uh, but, but it's true, right? I, we, we go, but actually it's just singing. It's just science. What's the big deal? It's just hearing. You know, once you've heard, heard many things, it's actually heard enough after a while. And uh, the point, of course, is that there is something much more profound in life. There are things that are far more interesting than these things. And you understand also the downside of this. That's why the idea of the perception of the dissatisfaction with the whole world. I mean, I've talked about this a lot already, but the uncertainty in these things, the unreliability, the, um, we just don't know when things are going to be available or not be available. So it's both dangerous, also it is a lower kind of happiness. So you withdraw the mind from that, uh, it gives access to something greater. And that's the point. Uh, so it is both low and dangerous at the same time. Uh, it is low and a cause of suffering at the same time. Uh, and that's why you then move to something higher in you, higher instead. Uh. Let's go on to the next one. When the perception of impermanence is developed and cultivated, uh, it is very fruitful and beneficial. Uh, 
It culminates in the freedom from death and ends with the freedom from death. That's what I said, but why did I say it? Uh, when a mendicant often meditates with the mind reinforced with the perception of impermanence, the mind draws back from material possessions, honor, and fame. That's why I said it. This is why I said it. So again, this is an alternative from what we have seen so far. You can see all of these things have a number of different ways in which they can be expressed. And this is laba, sakkara, siloka. Yeah, possessions is laba, gain. Uh, laba, sak sakkara is like people honoring you. And fame, siloka, is uh, fame or, uh, or good, uh, good renown or, or something like that. Uh, yeah, but why are you not so concerned about these things? Because you understand all of these things are just temporary. Uh, all of these things come for a while. Uh, let's say that you get a lot of honor in your life. Uh, and then once you get that honor, then you have to keep it to be happy afterwards. Not that keeping it gets, you know, that becomes kind of painful. Uh, or you become famous. Uh, and everyone wants to be, kind of people often think fame is great. But I think fame is probably a pain in the backside. Uh, yeah, if you're going to be honest about it. Uh, because pain means that people always know who you are, they see you, they, they kind of look after you. And uh, even someone like Ajahn Brahm, who is not that famous, he's famous enough in some countries that it's painful, yeah, and it becomes too much. And he, even when he goes to the toilet, he can't go to the toilet in peace. Because people kind of follow him, follow him around. That's what he says. And uh, so... Uh, <laughs> Imagine the dukkha, right? That's kind of really terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and so these things are, once you understand how impermanent they are, yeah? and of course, once you have a lot of honor, once you have a lot of fame, then you tend to identify with that. Uh, it becomes important to you. Then you hold on to it. You're attached to it. Uh, yeah, And then, of course, it becomes very problematic once you do that because it is, it is impermanent. Uh, it is unreliable. It is uncertain. Uh, and once you're famous, you have to watch everything you do, otherwise people are going to say bad things about you, huh? yeah, etc., etc., etc. So the perception of impermanence is very powerful. Huh? And uh, this is one of the dangers sometimes, if, especially perhaps in monastic life, yeah, that you can become uh, attached to all of these things because you become famous and people look after you and all of these kind of things. Huh? And so you have to be careful. And this is one of the things I like about someone like Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, it's kind of... Uh, Ajahn Brahm is this um, person that who, uh, who, you know, you sit next to him, you have a feeling that he is someone who doesn't take himself seriously at all. Yeah? You sit next to him, there's no sense of ego there. There's no sense of self. When he's in the monastery, he sits in the one corner and then the other monks are there. And sometimes he's like invisible in the monastery. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's like you, don't, you wonder whether he is he here or is he not here. <laughs> and uh, there's something very beautiful about that. Here is one of the most... One, probably one of the most famous monks in the world, or that's what he has been for a while anyway. I'm not sure what's, where he is now. And uh, one of the most famous monks in the world, and in the monastery he looks like just nothing. Yeah. <laughs> he just doesn't kind of have any person, he doesn't have any, he doesn't go, go around saying, here I am, look at me, or anything like that. It's more like he just disappears in the monastery. Yeah? He fades away. Yeah? There's no sense of that. And that's actually very beautiful. Yeah? Yeah, this ability to not take all of those silly things seriously at all. Right? He's a great example of that. Huh? And if you start to take yourself a little bit too seriously, huh? he will let you know very quickly. Huh? <laughs> Which is good, yeah? It means you don't have a chance to kind of allow your ego to become stupid or anything like that. Huh? That's kind of really beautiful. Huh? And so you see that in practice, the only way you can really do that huh? is if you have a higher kind of happiness. Huh? And of course, Ajahn Brahm is one of those really incredibly powerful meditators. Huh? And because of that, he has access to things that are way beyond ordinary people. Uh, and so this is kind of the, um, how you deal with these things. Uh. Anyway. Uh. Mm -hmm. So let's go on to the next one now. When the perception of suffering in impermanence is developed and cultivated, it is very fruitful and beneficial. It culminates in the freedom from uh, death and ends with the freedom from death. This is what I said, but why did I say it? 
When a mendicant often meditates with a mind reinforced, with a perception of suffering and impermanence, they establish a keen perception of danger, of sloth, laziness, slackness, negligence, lack of commitment, and failure to review. Like a killer with a drawn sword. That's what I said, and I said this is why I said it. Yeah. So, uh, like, as I have mentioned before, the problem with things being impermanent is that they are unreliable, they are uncertain, they will not be there when you want it to be there. You're attached to these things and it, well, everything is kind of ripped from your grip. You cannot hold on to these things. There's nowhere to take a stand. The moment you try to stand somewhere, the earth starts shaking and you fall over. Yeah, there's nothing to hold on to in this world. And that's kind of scary because we always hold on to things. We need to hold on to things. The sense of self, one of the problems of the sense of self is that the consequence of it is that you hold on. As long as you have a sense of self, you have no choice, but you have to attach. That's kind of scary. Yeah, you have to attach, basically. And so uh, you realize, actually, even though I have to attach, uh, there is nothing to attach to. Nothing in the world that can, is, uh, is stable enough to be able to attach to. And so what you have to hold on to temporarily until you go really deeper, you have to hold on to the triple gem, the teachings of the Buddha, to meditation practice. Yeah, that is where you can find some degree of stability. Yeah. And so you understand the danger. Yeah? Whenever anything is impermanent, it is bound to lead to suffering. Why? Because we attach to those things that are not uh, attachable, if you like. Yeah? So this is a problem. And of course, when you see that, uh, then you, it starts to concern you. Huh? Yeah? And you start, this is how the practice becomes very important. Huh? And you will notice the, um, the simile. I, I like this kind of simile. I, would, I gave that when I gave a talk on Sunday. Uh, night. Uh, and this is the simile of uh, when you are about to cross a road. Uh, yeah? Why, how does this perception of impermanence, how does it lead to a lack of sloth, laziness, slackness, and all of these kind of things? Uh, and the reason is because you have right view. Uh, yeah? Right view is precisely the seeing the danger in what is impermanent. Uh, seeing the, suf sorry, the suffering and danger of what is impermanent. You understand that there is a real problem. Uh, and the more you develop this perception, the more you understand the danger in the world. Yeah, now is the chance to get out of this. Now is to really establish this alternative refuge in meditation, in the Dhamma, Atta Deepa, Dhamma Deepa. Yeah, making yourself a refuge, make, making the Dhamma your refuge. That is what you understand. And now is the opportunity. If I don't take it now, it may not come back again. And the idea, and I think this is quite this is quite a nice simile, because it shows you that uh, mindfulness is not enough to live really well. Often we think that mindfulness is sufficient. If you're mindful, then you will be able to be kind. You're able to avoid the bad things in life. But very often mindfulness is not enough. Yeah, because you forget, you you become mindless. You forget what is going on. You're too busy with your phone to kind of see the world around you. In daily life, too many things happening. We're already juggling ten things. We can't deal with an 11th one, which is the Dhamma. So we put the Dhamma to one side for the moment because we've got too many other things going on. Yeah, This is kind of life for us. So mindfulness is not always there. But fortunately, there is something far more powerful than mindfulness. And that thing which is more powerful is right view. And you know this, and you know this precisely from the simile of crossing a road. Yeah, If you're going to cross the street in here in KL, and it's dangerous, right? There are cars coming too fast, even just walking down... I was walking down with uh, Annie Wern and his friends and our friends just uh, yesterday after the, uh, after the session here. Uh, and just kind of down there was dangerous enough. Yeah, cars coming very fast. And then I was told off by Annie Wern for kind of walking dangerously for Jay walking across the street. <laughs> so we, we also made it extra interesting by doing a bit of Jay walking and kind of crossing the street kind of where we shouldn't. Uh, don't tell anyone I said this. This is kind of secret information. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> and so, but still, we certainly looked left and right. Yeah, absolutely. We looked left because we knew the cars were coming very fast. And so, why is it that you look left and right? Is it because you are very mindful? Or is it because you know it's dangerous? 
It's, it's because you know it's dangerous. Very often you come to a street and you may not be mindful at all. You're on your phone, you're talking to someone, you're all over the place, no mindfulness. But even if you have zero mindfulness, you still remember to look left and right. And that is because of right view. And so that perception, that right view, is actually far more important than mindfulness. Or what you can say is that the perception, the right view, informs mindfulness, so that mindfulness remembers to look at that time. But it is right view which lies behind it. It is right view which is the significant thing. And this is what we're seeing here. Yeah? Understanding, establishing this perception of impermanence, why it is problematic. And the, the more powerful that perception is, the more clear that right view is, the more you will always remember to look left and right before you do anything. You will never slack off. You will always see, especially being virtuous as fundamental to this life. Everything you do will be measured according to the virtue as the Buddha explains the idea of virtue and morality. You never become too slack. You never become negligent. You're always committed to this path. Yeah? Not only the five precepts, but all kinds of virtue, yeah? all kinds of generosity, all kinds of kindness. That is what happens. And so this is, again, the idea of power of right view. And this is one of the reasons that the development of these perceptions, maybe not all of them, but some of them, can be incredibly powerful and useful in the spiritual practice. And you will notice there, the last one is like a killer with a drawn sword. Right? It's, it's very powerful. What do you mean, a killer with a drawn sword? Well, it's like if you go wrong, like I said before, if you go wrong, it is more dangerous to act wrongly than it is to be killed by that car. But yeah, because if you're killed by the car, okay, you get killed, so then you carry on in your next life. But if you make a bad action, you're actually letting yourself down. And you're actually having a bad future as a consequence. You don't get a bad future by just getting killed. That is neutral. But if you do bad actions, you're actually developing a bad future for yourself. So that is much more dangerous. You're going to have to die anyway. So it's like a killer with a drawn sword. Yeah, you are kind of asking for a bad death, uh, etc., if you do this. And so you become that keen. It is more dangerous than dying. So if you are afraid of a killer with a drawn sword, you should definitely be afraid of uh, not living up to the Dhamma, so to speak. Yeah. So, hmm. <laughs> Let's go on then. Just, uh, I'm going to take a sip of coffee. Okay, so we are coming up, I think, to the, um, the last one in this chapter. Let's have a quick look at this one as well. When the perception of non-self in suffering is developed and cultivated, it is very fruitful and beneficial. It culminates in the deathless and ends with the deathless. That's what I said, but why did I say it? When a mendicant often meditates for the mind reinforced for the perception of non-self in suffering, uh, the mind is rid of eye-making, mind-making, and conceit for this conscious body and all external stimuli. It has gone beyond discrimination and is peaceful and well freed. This is what happens when you do the non-self perception. Uh, yeah? You get rid of eye-making, so there's no more uh, you know, I am making means uh, I am this, this is me, yeah, I am this thing. Mind making is ownership, so no more ownership. Conceit for this conscious body and all external stimuli, it means that you don't, uh, you don't have any sense of identity anymore, you don't identify with anything in the world, uh, either within the five khandhas that are yours uh, or anything outside of the five khandhas. Uh. You've gone beyond discrimination. Discrimination is, uh, the Pali word is vidda. And vidda means, uh, this is what actually, when we talk about the uh, 
inferiority complex or superiority conceit or the equality conceit, this is the word in Pali that is used, uh, the vidda. Yeah, so you don't have any sense of this conceit in regard to other people. You feel, don't feel superior, inferior, nor do you feel equal. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Don't have the equality conceit. This is one of those very Buddhist ideas, the equality conceit. Uh, and you are peaceful and well freed because the sense of self is what destroys peace ultimately. It is the worst thing. Uh, and you are imprisoned by the sense of self. This may seem very counter intuitive but that is basically the kind of the number one prison guard is the sense of self so very problematic yeah so i'm not going to say anything more about that because this is kind of towards the very end of the path just to kind of uh, note that it is there and so you have a you know you know with its existence and you can look it up if you're interested yeah. If a man they can often meditate with the mind reinforced with the perception of non-self in suffering, but the mind is not rid of eye-making, mind-making conceit for this conscious body and all external stimuli, nor has it gone beyond discrimination and is not peaceful and well-freed, they should know my perception of not-self in suffering is undeveloped. I don't have any distinction higher than before. I haven't attained the fruit of development. In this way, they are aware of the situation. They have some pajana. But if a man they can often meditate with the mind reinforcement, the perception of not self in suffering, and the mind is rid of mind making, mind making the conceit for this conscious body and all external stimuli, and has gone beyond discrimination and is peaceful and well free, they should know my perception of not self in suffering is well developed. I have realized distinction higher than before. I have attained the fruit of development in this way. They are aware of the situation, some pajana. When the perception of not-self in suffering is developed and cultivated, it is very fruitful and beneficial. It culminates in the deathless or ends in the freedom from death. That is what I said, and this is why I said it. These seven perceptions, when developed and cultivated, are very fruitful and beneficial. They culminate and end in the freedom from death. Okay, let us do some meditation again. We had somebody wanted to ask before. Did you want to ask that question now? I'm not sure who it was. Uh, I just like to share some experience uh, about death. Ah. Well, we spoke a lot about contemplation and death. Um, there's another aspect. Uh, which is uh, some, sometimes someone in the family, someone close to us will pass, uh, will pass away. Um, so um, in the beginning, uh, when I went to a, an institution, I came across a, a Dhamma friend who was uh, propagating uh, teachings to me. And uh, I explained to him that, well, without blaming him, I'm, I'm just explaining the scenario. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I, I explained to him that I was there uh, because uh, a family member had passed away and I was waiting for the monks uh, to perform a, a prayers, to offer prayers. And as I was talking to him, um, he understood what I said, but he, had, he held himself back from expressing uh, something in return. So he said, okay, let's look at this book. And he continued. Then after that, um, I met uh, the most senior monk um, and he asked me who was that and I told him so and so and he said, um, I'm very sorry for your loss. And I was taken aback <laughs> because I was not expecting him to say that. Yeah. Um, uh, I thought it would be an opportunity for him to talk about death or age. <laughs> you know, yeah. That would be the most impactful moment to speak about it. But instead, he, he just said, I'm so sorry for your loss. And he said it with his heart and sincerity. Yeah. And at that point of time, I actually saw him coming down from a holy man to a, a gentleman. You know, he was very humanistic. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was a very humbling experience for me. So since um, you shared about your losses, hmm. your father and your sister, so I think some of us, we heard you, but we hesitate to express our sympathy. So I would like <laughs> to take this opportunity to say, just sorry for your losses. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
Okay, that's very kind of you. Yeah, you don't have to worry too much because uh, I've been a Buddhist monk for so long that uh, I kind of, uh, I sort of expect these things now, you know. <laughs> I expect the unexpected. <laughs> so uh, I, I, the way I think about death, and this is what I've learned from Ajahn Brahm, but, is that um, when someone has had a good life, yeah, and my, my father and sister, they had good lives, uh, and they were good, reasonably good people as well. Uh, and when someone is a good people, they have a good future. Yeah, and so when they have a good future, they are probably quite happy where they are now. And so I just think, good on you, well done, yeah, for being where you are. And uh, I, I'm not really too concerned, too concerned about them. So, uh, but anyway, it's very kind of you to say that. So I appreciate that. All right. Anything else that needs to be sorted out then? Back there, uh, Lina. Right. Uh, thank you, Ajahn. A very uh, small comment or question. Um, we have so many suttas on um, uh, Sanya, mm. like Patma Sanya, Dutya Sanya, yeah. and uh, Girmananda Sutta. Um, is there uh, like is there a particular reason why it has been repeated so many times? And yeah. like uh, like the Ahara Patikula Sut uh, Sanya, yeah. like this is all bit kind of covered in Adinava Sut Sanya or yeah. uh, uh, Sabiloka Abhinarata Sanya, you know, like distaste of world and something. All of that has been covered. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it has been repeated so many times. One. And secondly, like certain things like uh, Niroda Sanya, Viraga Sanya, hmm. uh, you know, uh, th these are not kind of uh, and mindfulness of breathing. They are kind of not included in this particular Dutya Sanya Sutya. So yeah. any particular reason for this kind of uh, discrepancy or not discrepancy really, like kind of difference? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think it's just that uh, the, the different occasions, on, on different occasions, the Buddha would... Uh, bring out different things, probably depending on the audience and these kind of things, you know. And there would be some degree of overlap, but also some degree of difference, depending on the, on the circumstances. Uh, and uh, so the idea is just to get the different angles on the Dhamma. I mean, this sutta is also a bit different in the way they talk about the development of the Sanya. It's talk about it in a different way. Uh, whereas the uh, Girimanda Sutta was slightly different in the way, kind of, the way the perception was actually explained. Uh, so you explain it in slightly different ways. And after a while, you get the more complete picture of what it is about. And many of these things are, indeed, they are very overlapping. And I think that's the point. Yeah? Almost all of them come down to things like impermanence, for example, and, and these kind of things. So that's kind of maybe the foundational perception of all the perceptions. So they, that, that's what it kind of comes back to. So uh, and I think that is kind of part of the point of the Dhamma, to have a degree of a lot of overlap and a lot of, uh, yeah, I was also kind of wondering with the Girmananda Sutta, uh, especially talking about Viraga and Niroda, Pahana, mm. and mindfulness of breathing, whether it's kind of more profound and it's for monastics. Uh, and the other one, uh, the Padma and the Duttiya Sanya Sutta, maybe they are more targeted at uh, lay people. Um, um, and uh, yeah. I, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Please. Um, yeah. The other thing I've been wanting to say for a long Ajahn, and because nobody was asking any questions, so I just might as well say it, yeah. is that um, I struggle because, uh, uh, especially when I began Buddhism a long time ago, is that because of the repetition. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, my mind tends to just kind of shut off. But now I know what Buddha wants to say, so I've so gotten used to suttas. Yeah. Um, but especially uh, the Ajahns, they go very slowly. Uh, so I, my mind just kind of switches off. So I really, really appreciate. I know there have been a lot of people who say you go fast. Yeah. But from my point of view, you could go even faster. I really, really appreciate. Yeah. My mind is, you know, switched on all the time. And I'm really, very grateful for your okay. teaching because it really makes sense to me. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, many of these perceptions, some of them are more for monastics and some of them are more for everyone. Uh, uh, but I, so I haven't really, I, I don't really know. I think... Uh, Probably both of these suttas are fairly much kind of a bit monastic oriented, but a lot of it is also applicable for lay people. So I think it's nice to go through it uh, and just to have a quick look. Yeah. And the, um, the kind of the reasons why I'm doing so many perceptions on this retreat, and maybe you think, and I'm sure that uh, even though I may be going faster than some people, I may 
as you say, not going fast enough for some people. <laughs> There's always kind of this middle way. Uh, but the idea is that every retreat, you have a bit of a theme, yeah? And so the theme is like seeing the world like the Buddha, perceiving like the Buddha. That's kind of the theme. And that's why I'm kind of being quite repetitive on the perceptions and going through it many times. Uh, uh, so that's kind of the reason. Uh, so there's many ways of doing retreats. You can have like an overview retreat where you do an all general overview of the suttas, or you can have more spe specific kind of things. Uh, and so it depends a bit on how you structure these things. Uh. So, but this part of the retreat is the more kind of he more heavy part. The next part is going to be more um, developing joy. Yes, that's kind of a more kind of more uh, slightly different angle on things. Anyway, anyway. So thanks so much, uh, Lena. Please, sir. I don't know, just a quick one. Yeah. Um, while meditating, I could hear the bird, bird call, very yeah. sweet. Yeah. And I'm attracted to birds. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. So the mind goes very quickly to say bird call, yeah. sweet. I like it. <laughs> yeah. And I tell myself, oh no, now I'm supposed to be a passive observer, you know, just let it be and so on. How do I quickly stop that natural clinging? Yeah. And, and just come back to, you know, like you, you asked us to reflect on um, perception of uh, contact, right? The, uh, the, the right. repulsion of having that as a, hmm. a, a attachment and it's not going to help us and so on. Yeah. That the whole thing, you know, just I'm still, I still realize I'm still attracted to it. So yeah. how do I tell myself, quickly come back to you know, <laughs> what you're doing and yeah. stop? Well, yeah, it, it, is about, it is about just what you prioritize. It's about prioritizing things. And uh, so much about the spiritual practice, it's about prioritizing the spiritual path, including meditation, including whatever else that you do. Uh, give that priority because you know that that is, in a, in a sense, if you want to do something which builds up your future, that is where your future is built up. Uh, and all of these other things, well, that one is just an indulgence in the present moment. Indulging in the present moment is not going to do anything good for you in the future. So you're kind of wasting your time a little bit. You think, oh, yeah, I'm wasting my time. Okay, let you go. <laughs> no more wasting time, right? So you learn to think about things in this way. And after a while, you... And, but the most important thing, really, at the end of the day, is to enjoy the meditation. Mm -hmm. The more you enjoy it, uh, the more easy it is to stay with the meditation object. Uh, because the reason why the bird is there may be because the meditation is kind of boring anyway. I'll listen to the bird instead. Uh, I, you know, this kind of thing, that's another aspect of it. Uh, so all of these things, gradually, they come together. Uh, but you have to be very patient because the mind takes a long time to turn around. It takes a long time to change its perspective on things. Uh, but uh, as you practice, keep on going, you gradually, gradually tick, 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 you move around different direction. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's stop there anyway. Uh,